John Cotter, who wrote the book Leading Change, once shared, quote, over the years, I have become convinced that we learn best and change from hearing stories that strike a chord within us. John continues, quote, those in leadership positions who fail to grasp or use the power of stories risk failure for their companies and for themselves. That's why I have a question for you as a financial brand leader watching or listening to this podcast. Do you really know how to tell a story? Having a deep understanding of story, having a deep understanding of narrative, of narrative structure, it can help you unlock future growth at your bank, at your credit union, or at your fintech. That's why on today's episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast, we are going to dive deep to explore how stories inspire change and transformation, transformation that leads to future growth for yourself, for your team, and for your organization. Greetings and hello. My name is James Robert Lay, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. Today's episode is part of the Exponential Insight series, and joining me for today's conversation is Joe Byerly. Joe is an active duty Army Lieutenant Colonel who has also been sharing his thinking on his website, fromthegreennotebook.com, where he's been actively blogging for over a decade, as well as podcasting over the past four years. Now, I highly recommend that you check out Joe's thinking on his website or through his podcast because he is committed to helping you lead to be the best version of yourself, which is exactly what we're going to be talking about on today's podcast as we explore the truly transformative power of story and narrative specifically for you as a financial brand leader. Welcome to the show, Joe. It is great to share time with you today, buddy. Well, thanks for the invite, James Robert. I'm I'm looking forward to the discussion today. I have been looking forward to this conversation for quite a while now. And I think those who are watching uh, or listening are going to get a lot of value from it. And before we get into the power of story even more deeply, I would say how understanding story, archetypes, narrative structure can make you an even better leader. What is good in your world right now, personally or professionally? It is always your pick to get started. Yeah, James Roberts. So I've been in the Army now for just over 20 years. Um, I, I'm a commander. I lead about 500 folks uh, over here in Europe in the 2nd Cav Regiment, and I am retiring uh, this summer. And, uh, you know, in the military, we make a joke that like, I'm finally leaving Shawshank <laughs> and, uh, and getting out on the other side. So I, I'm, I've had an amazing career. The army's provided me some awesome opportunities, got to meet some amazing people. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm moving on to the next thing. Well, it definitely is. There's a lot of stories you could probably unpack through that experience. Tell me one, how did, you know, how did you, you, you've obviously have a, a, a great career in the army, but then about 10 years ago, you started a whole other journey. What, what's the origin story there? Because I think it will bridge the gap nicely of, of how we're getting into this whole discussion today about story, leadership, communication. So take us back to 2013. Yeah, so I, um, you know, I, I went to the University of North Georgia, um, you know, reading, writing, reflecting, that wasn't really my style. It was keg parties, having a good time, um, you know, everything but being intellectually stimulated. And so I commissioned in the Army. I did a couple deployments uh, to Iraq, one during the surge and one like a year and a half later and got back and, you know, through mentors and, and people I met along the way. Uh, discovered the power of reading, um, you know, especially like self-help books, um, even like certain fiction books and being able to pull the lessons out of those. And so uh, I kind of became a zealot for it and then eventually found myself working for uh, then at the time, Major General H.R. McMaster, who went on to become the National Security Advisor uh, to the president. And we were creating this program where officers and leaders throughout the Army could go on this website and study. Well, anyways, 
um, you know, it was, it was painful. It was painful. I don't know if you know this, James Robert, but our government is highly uh, bureaucratic. And uh, it was like, we were trying to buy a brand new tank, not create a website where people could learn from. Um, so I was surrounded by people who were creating blogs at the time. And so I, I realized that maybe I could do this on my own um, and not have to go through all this red tape. So in the military, one of the things that everybody's issued, uh, I think it's regardless of service, is this thing called a, it's, it's a green notebook. And it just says federal supply service. It's a hard notebook. It's all of our supply rooms. And we use it for taking notes in meetings, copying down lessons learned after missions, um, you know, just your to-do list, whatever. It's like a Swiss army knife for your brain. And so um, that's what I called this blog. And, and originally I was so scared uh, to put my name to anything. So I, I was writing by a, a nom de guerre um, for about six months and wow. just producing like a blog post a week uh, with, with the help of friends editing. And then uh, eventually I, I realized like I was a little bit comfortable, a little bit more comfortable putting my name on it. And then friends started asking if they could publish. And then people I didn't know started writing and sending in submissions. And then I started asking for other people to help. Well, flash forward to today, uh, I think the website, I think we've had over 4 million um, visits, like over 2.5 million visitors. And oh. it's really cool the impact from the Green Notebook has had all over, not just the U.S. military, um, but we get submissions and we have a huge readership with our, our NATO partners. So it's this like crazy idea that uh, that, that just grew um, out of frustration. And uh, I, I've been doing that for the last decade. I've this has been a passion project, I'm sure, like like you've had in your life, um, that I've had to work on, you know, the hours before going to work in the morning or, you know, maybe a couple hours uh, when I got home or, you know, a few hours Saturday and Sunday morning. And uh, it's just it's just been amazing. It's it's, uh, it's probably the reason I'm sitting here on this podcast today. Well, what an amazing story that is taking us all the way back to the origin. And I think about the courage that it took to go beyond of where you were to step into the unknown, but you were doing it from a place of creating value for others for, to, to help others. And I think if, I want to, I want to roll back on a couple of things. You know, if you go back to your college days, um, reading, thinking, reflecting, writing, it wasn't part of the narrative and through life, through circumstance, through mentorship, it opened up a whole new way of thinking, which led to a whole new way of operating and a whole new way of doing. Come back to this idea of self-development here, because when we think about leadership, one of the things that I often reflect on, even within my own personal narrative is we have to learn to lead ourselves before we have the opportunity to lead others. And sometimes leading ourselves is probably, can be, at least from my own personal experience, it's one of the most challenging aspects of leadership. When you think about your, the, go ahead. No, I was gonna say it's the hardest um, thing to do. And I know that, um, you know, you and, and Audrey have read some of the Stoics, read Ryan Holiday's work. Um, but yeah, there, there's a great quote um, by Seneca. And basically, it says that the hardest empire to rule yeah. is the empire of oneself. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 I, and I don't know exactly your story. But like, for mine, um, you know, I was making all sorts of mistakes along the way. And the leadership that I was going off of uh, coming up was, you know, stuff I saw in movies. It was coaches. It was teachers. It was my parents. And so, like, that was my model of leadership. And if you think about it, that's very limited. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, you know, behind me is thousands and thousands of years of leadership. Um, you know, I'm, I'm able to study by you know, study the works of Plutarch, study the works of, like we talked about uh, a few minutes ago, Seneca. Um, I mean, so, so many of these people and, 
now when you're facing problems, facing challenges, even identifying opportunities that you may have missed before, you're able to do that because you've got, you know, thousand years of people whispering in your ear, kind of which way to go with it. It's fascinating. And in this, it's one of the reasons uh, be a lifelong learner is one of our four principles to achieve exponential growth here at the Digital Growth Institute. Uh, exponential growth is when uh, it, you have the perception that you're growing personally and professionally at the same exact time. I don't think we can separate kind of these two worlds because what's happening personally is going to impact you professionally. What's happening professionally is going to impact you personally. I even think about like a lot of the reading that I've been doing is going back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, off the top of my head, uh, As Man Thinketh uh, by James Allen. And the power of thought, uh, the power to create, starting with just thought, but it all comes back to this principle. You mentioned Ryan Holiday and the Stoic philosophy of, of self-mastery. Um, when you think about your own story of growth, who has inspired you most through the books that you've read? Like you said, you've got thousands of years behind you supporting you if you're not watching he is an amazing library um behind him who who wh which writers which thinkers even have inspired your own thinking yeah i mean you you call it a library james roberts some people might call it an addiction um <laughs> but yeah like it's it's been different people at different times sure um, you know, when I was, when I was a very direct leader, I was, you know, studying the works of Horatio Nelson, um, you know, like his stories. I thought they were absolutely amazing. Um, you know, you had this guy basically ignoring the orders of his superiors to do what he thought was the right thing to do. Um, so like that was somebody I admired. And then, you know, a little bit later on, I, I started getting into the Stoics and, you know, learning from them. And then probably like the last three years, like the writings that have impacted me the most have been uh, Joseph Campbell, um, uh, hero, hero with a thousand faces. I have about four or five of his collections of essays back there, uh, books of his collections of essays. And it, it like spurred, um, a whole series I've been writing for a year. And another one is, is Stephen Pressfield, who I got introduced to the hero's journey on his blog back in 2012, which was the notebook I just showed you. Yes. I was writing down notes from that blog post, uh, you know, 12 years ago. And, uh, I'm like looking at those same notes, um, uh, that a di very different person wrote down. So, uh, yeah, that's, it's different people at different points in my life. When you mentioned Joseph Campbell and the hero with a thousand faces, uh, the the power of myth, um, that has been a big influence within my own thinking and my own personal story because working within financial services, I remember going to conferences and you would have these speakers saying, telling these bank leaders, credit union leaders, you need to tell a better story when it came to marketing and sales. And I would be sitting there and I'm like, I agree, but what does that really mean? Like give, put some meat on that bone, make it practical, give us something to actually apply. And so I went down this journey probably around 2013, 2014, Campbell was one of the, the thinkers that I would say really influenced my own perspective and this is a great segue into the power of story when it comes to leadership, because John Carter, he, he once wrote, and I'm going to quote him, he said, over the years, I have become convinced that we learn best and change. And this idea of leadership, learning, change, transformation, he says, over the years, I've become convinced that we learn best and change from hearing stories that strike a chord within us. Those in leadership positions who fail to grasp or use the power of stories risk failure for their companies and for themselves. Why is that? Why, why in a leadership role, if we don't truly understand the power of story, the power of narrative, how can we risk failure for our organizations and for ourselves, for our teams? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think like we're kind of geared towards leading with logic a lot of times. And, you know, logic is actually like a fairly new invention. It's only a couple thousand years old. But the thing that goes back to the time where, you know, our great ancestors were sketching stuff on cave walls yeah. and uh, gathered around fires, like those were stories. And so I think like if logic hits the brain, stories hit the heart. And then that's what really makes people move. If you look at like all the great movements that have ever happened, they've stemmed from somebody telling a story, typically a story of hope. And so I, I think story is just, just the way to go. And, you know, jo Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, I think why I've become so obsessed with it is that, you know, you, you talk, I want to go back to something you said, you said, you know, people talk about like professional and personal and you're like, it's, it's, it's all intertwined. And the whole thing about the hero's journey and what Joseph Campbell believed was the story of the hero's journey was a manifestation of our psyches. Yeah. And what it was, was like, as we grow up, we build this persona. Like I, I'm sure that we, everybody does it, you know, in their professional lives, you build this persona of, you know, I'm the, the general, I'm the CEO, whatever, I'm the banker, I'm the lawyer. And so you, you build that up. And at the same time, you're pushing down your individuality. And so really like the hero's journey is just the story of a hero realizing they're stuck, feeling this call to go do something with their lives, to bring that, that side of them forth. And then going in and, and slaying the dragon, uh, you know, killing the wizard, whatever. Right. And then bringing forth some prize, whether it's a golden fleece, a sword, a magic elixir. And what Joseph Campbell said was it was us destroying that personality that, that we've built and allowing our individuality to, to come forth. And then we can bring that gift back to our communities. And that particular story of the hero's journey is in like every myth, every religion, every popular movie today, yeah. you can see the hero's journey played out. And it's the reason we keep buying tickets, buttered popcorn and sitting in a theater for an hour and 42 minutes because that story, that narrative hits us in the heart. You know, when you, you're going through, it's pattern matching. It's pattern matching people, behavior, at both macro and micro level. And this goes all the way back to some of the, like you said, how we used to communicate. Paintings around a fire, talking about the epic of the day, you know, slaying the beast, if you will. Beowulf, great example uh, of that, all the way to um, Star Wars, the Karate Kid. They all follow the same pattern. And you mentioned this idea of logic, um, Dr. Norman Holland is a psychologist, and one of the things that he mentioned is that humans respond not only intellectually but also emotionally to a story. So you have this he head heart connection. Now, what you mentioned before government bureaucracy, um, change. I think of institutions like financial brands, banks, credit unions trying to navigate the complexity of changes, whether it's digital transformation, cultural transformation, brand transformation. I think a lot of change and transformation initiatives are being led from a place of logic. And that makes sense because if you think of the MO of a financial brand leader, a bank leader, very smart, analytical, left brain driven thinking. But then we also have to think about the role of the heart. How, how do we bridge the two worlds? And maybe it's back to your point of the story or the journey that we have to take first and foremost within thinking about your perspective on Joseph Campbell. How do we bridge that? How do we resolve that conflict? Because Every great story, as you know, is going to have conflict. In fact, it's the conflict of the story 
that really helps us to pay attention. Cortisol kicks into the brain. So what's the, how do we resolve the conflict and tension of this head versus heart, particularly through a institutionalized vertical like financial services? Yeah, I have no idea. That's that's probably the toughest question I, I've ever been asked. I think, I, well, first of all, like you're talking about conflict, right? And like the hero is the hero because of the choices they make mm. when faced um, with that conflict. So you're right. Like every great story has conflict that that's the thing that defines the hero in the first place, which yeah. is, again, I think why I'm obsessed with it. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you could go into a business and be like, hey, we've got to get rid of of old systems. We've got to clean out, you know, these old processes that we have that are no longer serving us. And you're like, okay, like it, it's a task, right? But there's a story I love. Um, and it's, uh, and, and I've taught, like I've talked about this before when talking about change. And uh, it's in uh, Brit- Britain, they're preparing for uh, the First World War. They're building up their fortifications on the island. And so they take these cannons that they had used during the Boer War. And the Boer War is in Africa. These cannons are, um, you know, pulled around by horses. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a horse with a cannon on a, uh, on a little cart, gets pulled around. And that's how they were fighting the Boer War. So now flash forward a couple decades they're now in uh world war one and they're mounting these cannons up on coastal fortifications and so you know just like and they're trying to get faster at doing it faster at firing the cannons and so this guy brings in a consultant back then which is what we all do when we have a problem and uh and the consultant what he would do is he would take pictures of the process that they were going through Mm. and he he would get them developed and the commander was sitting there with the consultant trying to figure out how to make the time go slower. And the consultant goes, I understand all the movements that the British soldiers are doing, except this one right here. They pull their arms down by their side. They stand at attention for you know two seconds, and then you fire the cannon. Why are they waiting? And they're like, ah, they're holding the bridle of the horses right before the cannon goes off. And so... So here you here you have these guys that the horses are no longer a part of the equation, but they're still doing that. And so um, when I wrote about this story, probably about nine years ago, the title of it was Let Go of the Horses. And so, like, imagine you're a leader. You're trying to get these processes, um, you know, trying to get people to, to rally around getting rid of things that no longer serve us. And now you're saying, hey, we've got to let go of the horses, you know, after telling that story. I think that sticks a little bit more instead of, Hey, we have to optimize. Mm. Got to let go of what you know to continue to grow because even what are we holding on that is no longer there? Um, it's just, we've gotten so used to that, that it's all we know. And I, I think this maybe a follow up to this, cause that's a fantastic story. And there's a practical example because I think there's two ways to communicate. You can communicate in data points or you can communicate in narrative. And the data point is the logic, the narrative though, it's the heart, it's the emotion. And that it, it stirs something from within. And even when I think about, you know, a lot of financial brand leaders are talking about data, data, data. It's kind of the flavor of the day right now, that and AI. Um, I'm like, listen, You have to remember that behind every data point that you have on your account holders, there's DNA. And what's a common misunderstanding? If we're talking about story and we're talking about narrative and just thinking about your own journey, what's a common misunderstanding that leaders might have about story, about storytelling that is holding them back from connecting with others on their team, within their organization, where they could connect at a deeper level, but because there's a misunderstanding about story, they're not able to bridge that gap. Yeah. Have you read The Art of Possibility? I have not. Uh, 
by the Xanders. It's a great book. Matter of fact, Seth Godin recommended it when he was on my podcast. And uh, they have a great quote. And it says, all life comes in narrative form. It's a story we tell. The narrative or myth shapes our perceptions and what we pay attention to. So in other words, Mm. everything that we do is a story. Like there is no objective reality. It's just your story. It's my story. It's, it's, it's just the way life works. And that's the way we all interpret life. And so I think it's leveraging the power of story to, to get points across because like, ah, oh, that's stories were things that my parents told me when I was a kid or stories or what I, I get into to escape, um, you know, just the, the stressors of the day um, or, or stories are what I do on the weekends when I go to the movies. No, man, like we live stories and, and, and they're so powerful. I've got another story for you. Tell me. <laughs> so, um, you know, Victor Frankl. Yes. Right. Um, it is, you know, he's two years, right? Like he's going through, you know, he just left the ghetto. He's going through the concentration camp. Um, you know, he's lost his, his wife. He's lost his, his parents, his, his unborn child. Like he's lost everything. Right. And the story that he began to tell himself was that he had to get his life's work out there to help other people. And so he was literally writing his thoughts and processes on uh, logotherapy, like, uh, you know, making meaning out of life on scraps of paper as he was finding them. And he actually said, uh, you know, like, granted, he recognized that like luck was a part of it because, you know, that. Um, guards were picking random people and but he said the other part of it because he watched people give up hope was that holding on to that story is what helped him get through to to the other side so again I mean there, there's so many stories of stories out there um, that, that have helped sustain people especially in bad times so yeah I think it they're so powerful I could just tell you hey you know, James Robert, like, you know, just, just hope for the best, man. Um, but, but like you hear a story, it just, again, it touches the heart and, and drives you through. Well, this is something that I touched on in a keynote that I did at Finnovate, um, where I hypothesize when it comes to financial services and the relationship that people have with their money, people are looking for two things. First, they're looking for help. They're also looking for hope. But hope for so many people has to come before one is able, open, willing to receive help. And this gets back into science here because a Harvard Business Review article found that it's the happy endings to a story, which you're touching on this idea of of hope and positive endings and outcomes. It's the happy endings to a story Let's connect this back to the brain that trigger the limbic system to release dopamine, which then in result makes us feel more hopeful, feel more optimistic about the future. And the the point on Viktor Frankl is, is so well taken, because if you think about even through the lens of a financial services leader going all the way back to, you know, the start of this decade, they started 2020 with a matter of perspective based upon past experience that 2020 was going to be like 2019, was going to be like 2018, 2017, but we all know what happened. And then 2021, we have bit, you know, financial crisis. And then we have kind of economic turmoil, fed raises rates. So this whole thing of like challenge is one that I said, listen, buckle up buttercup because this decade is going to be a bumpy ride. And I, I got some flack for that. And, and I'm like, listen, I'm just telling the truth on this. And I think, I think the more that you can prepare your mind for the journey ahead, it's not going to make the journey any easier, but you can, you can get the team to take the journey with so that you don't have to do it solo. Speaking of solo, Luke, Luke had Han Solo. He had Chewie. He had C-3PO. He had Princess Leia. I mean, Frodo had his whole, you know, gang to help him to get the ring to Mordor. 
It's like the hero doesn't have to take the journey alone. And, and a lot of this thinking for me is rooted in a book that was written back in 1997 called The Fourth Turning. It was very prophetic to what we're seeing and experiencing right now. And the fourth turning hypothesizes that, you know, we're going to be in this period of uncertainty, complexity, and chaos probably till the early 2030s. And then we'll enter into a new period, a new cycle, and it's just the cycles of time. But I like the way that you frame stories as a way to really give people help, to really give people hope. And you've given some really good examples. How have, how have your story telling skills because this is a skill that can be developed how have your skills evolved over the years for you as a leader yeah so i i used to be the logic guy like i was <laughs> hey everybody and then i would throw out some facts some dates and hey this is what we have to do and i realized that like that that doesn't that doesn't strike a chord and the people who i admired you know you're talking about heroes like they told stories, they told great stories. And um, I was like, okay, like, this is it. And then I started looking at the stories that, that resonate with me. And now like, that's all I communicate in probably to, uh, you know, getting people like, hey, you need to be quiet. But I, I communicate in stories now, because it's, it's the way to paint a picture for people and to, to like if you said, like, talk, talk to the heart of folks. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, but it, but it works and a story is memorable. That's the other thing. Like you probably don't remember, um, you know, in, in some of these uh, talks that, that you've been in the audience for, um, you know, people just talking in, in facts and figures, but you do remember the stories and you're probably still repeating stories today of ones that you've heard sitting in an audience. So yeah, I, everything's a story now, James Robert. I, I, don't, uh, I, don't, just, I don't speak in facts and figures anymore. But what is it that has influenced you most? I have a hypothesis, and I don't want to—I don't want to inject that into the conversation just yet. But for those who are watching or those who are listening, and they have perhaps some awareness that you know this is an area as a leader, I could build capability around. I could be even better as a leader, if I was to learn this skill, practically speaking, what, what has influenced you to build this skill set? Yeah, I think it, I think it was just a, a nat, like I said, it was a natural evolution and it was watching other people do it and be successful. And then it was like, that's the stuff that got me fired up. And so that's, that's what I, I've replicated. And, you know, Going back to the book addiction behind me, um, you there's tons of amazing stories in here that illustrate just about everything that you will face in life. Um, every challenge you'll encounter, every potential opportunity, there's a story in there that we can use to illustrate it. That's where I was going. It's the thousands of years of story and narrative that is supporting you behind you that if I was to hypothesize has, has been a huge influence because the more you read, the more, you know, the, your perspective continues to, to expand. And, and you were touching on this idea before about perspective. Perspective is the sum of context and framing. And when we think about stories, the stories we tell, the stories we tell ourselves first and foremost, we, we have, the movie theater of the mind. And the cool thing about the movie theater of the mind is we are the producer. We are the writer. We are the videographer. We are the director. We are the actor. And we can begin to tell ourselves a new story to transform our own thoughts going forward. Yeah. And so what's very important about what you just said, James Robert, is that sometimes we're a really crappy script writer. <laughs> like we tell the, we write the worst stories yeah. uh, about what's going on in our world. And we do that a lot of times unconsciously. Mm. Like we don't even realize we're doing it. I'm like, man, 
James Robert thinks I'm an idiot right now talking about all these things, right? Like it just popped, that didn't really pop up in my head, but like we do that all the time in conversation. And so I think once you realize you do that, um, and this, this is like one of the things I've been writing about lately, like once you realize you do that, once you realize that we think in narrative, you can start being very deliberate about the story that you want to write for yourself. Mm. Well, I mean, that comes back to something that Ben Hardy has written and, and talked about. Have you ever read any Ben Hardy, Hardy's work by any chance? Not yet. <laughs> highly, highly recommend the work of Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Um, he's written uh, Be Your Future Self Now. Uh, he's written uh, uh, 10X is Easier Than 2X with Dan Sullivan, Who Not How. I mean, just a great library of work that he is writing. But one of the things that he has said is that the, it's it's not the past. The past is not what determines the meaning of the present. It's the present that determines the meaning of the past. And we are able to recontextualize past experiences which often inform the stories that we're telling ourselves right now in the present moment. And, and on this idea of story narrative, before we start to wrap up, I, I, maybe we could go into maybe the dark side just a bit because you've recently written on LinkedIn about the shadow and as you were writing on this, it's the story. It's the it's the we have to go within. I was thinking about a scene from Empire Strikes Back. I don't know why I've been thinking about this scene because maybe it's my kids. We have four kids, and uh, thirteen, eleven, nine, and seven. I was a Star Wars geek growing up, but never really appreciated the narrative aspect of it, and, and didn't even really understand until reading Joseph Campbell how much Joseph Campbell influenced the work of in the writing of George Lucas. But in Empire Strikes Back, there's a scene when Luke is on Dagobah and he's being trained by Yoda and he goes into the cave. He's in the cave and he meets Darth Vader and he does battle with Darth Vader and he cuts Darth Vader's head off and then he gets his lightsaber and he cuts the mask and who's behind Darth Vader's mask? didn't fully appreciate this until my kids watched the movie maybe a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, wow, that's super deep. Who's behind the mask? It's Luke. When we think about story narrative leadership, why is it important to do shadow work? And what does that even mean for some who don't even understand the concept? Maybe they've never heard the term. Yeah, so so you're you're like the, you know you're talking about Luke having to go to Dagobah, having to go. He had to go into the cave to come out and be Luke Skywalker. I'm a huge fan of the Odyssey, yeah. and as Odysseus is making his way back to Ithaca, Cersei says, "Hey, you've got to go to Hades to go mm. talk to this prophet before you get home." And so he came back with with all this knowledge. And like every story they have to go to some sort of dark place in it. So any story that has the hero's journey, they go to a dark place before they come out to finally face, like he had to go there before he faced Darth Vader. Yeah. And so, um, you know, in, in, in psych psychological terms and what Carl Jung and Campbell believed is that when we build our professional identities in life, we push down, everything else uh, that doesn't fit neatly into that personality. So for me, I'm in the U S military. Like, you know, we have this persona that we ended up building, being very directive, very kind of in your face, being very uh, action oriented. And so there was this other side of me that was creative. I told you that like, I wasn't putting my name when I first started writing because I didn't want people to think I was a nerd, you know? And so I push this creative side of my personality down. And the reason why shadow work is so important and the hero's journey itself is so important, it's that inner part of us that's saying, hey, let that part of you come to the surface. Like the thing that makes me me is my creativity. You know, like everybody is, you know, whatever your profession is, everybody's a certain way 
But there's one thing that you and you and you and me, we all bring that's only us. It's the only thing that we can bring. But you've got to do the shadow work. You've got to go deep inside yourself through reflection, which is which is what I've been doing the last couple of years. And then you emerge. And I was very, um, you know, doing a lot of this reflecting. I realized, like, I'm not going to say, hey, I'm sorry for being this creative writer in, in the Army. Like, I'm going to be very proud of it. Um, and, I, and I'm going to own it. Right. And yeah. so uh, the other thing is there's, you know, you, you said he cut off Darth Vader's head and saw himself. There's other like darker side of our of ourselves in there. There's bad stuff, too, that we've pushed down that we can't that we can't do. And so it's making a conscious decision about what you bring forward into your job mm. and being acknowledging that, hey, there's other aspects of me that aren't so great. And and once you do that. That's when you're ready to finally slay the dragon and bring back the elixir, whatever your gift is, to your community. Wow. Joe, this has been such a wonderful conversation of the power of story to transcend the head and go deeper into the heart to inspire real human transformation whether that's transformation first and foremost of the self as a leader, because all transformation that leads to future growth must begin within to then go on to inspire the team because teams are made up of individuals from the team to then transform the organization and through the context of financial services and making to, to extend that transformation into the lives of account holders to help guide them beyond the financial stress and the anxiety that's taking a toll on their health, their relationships, their well-being, so that as a financial brand leader, you can continue to build the financial confidence of those who you are helping and guide them to an even bigger, better, and brighter future. What is a practical way as we wrap up here, Joe, for someone who is watching, someone who is listening, to begin to apply the tenets of story and narrative in their own journey of growth. One small thing that they can begin to do now to at least start to move forward and make progress. One is just know that everything is a story. I think, I think that's, that's the most important. And two is, is to read. Like, I, I love that you said you're an avid reader. I think once you start reading, you start collecting stories and then you're like this walking jukebox. <laughs> and you're able to to pull them out to to meet whatever situations um, that that you encounter, and you're able to get inspired by them. You're able to learn from them, and then you know from the Green Notebook, we say to help others lead with the best version of themselves. That's when I think you start leading with the best version of yourself. So is that is that practical, or is that too? No, no, and I think it's super practical. I'm gonna I'm not gonna push back on this, but I'm I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper because you just surfaced something that I believe is a pain point. It is a roadblock for many leaders right now, particularly through the lens of financial services, because I'm getting ready to publish my second book titled Banking on Change. And the subtitle is uh, The Leader's Guide to Achieve Exponential Growth in the Age of AI. And one of the things that we found in research for writing this book is the vast majority and we'll just say 80, 85% of financial brand leaders are, and I'm going to use the word investing, they're investing only two hours or less per week in their own going, learning, growth, and development. The reason they say is they're just too busy doing. They're just on this hamster wheel. And so the idea of reading, while it's very important to leaders like you, leaders like me, and I know that there are leaders within financial services who have a huge commitment to continue to learn and to read and to grow. But for those who are watching or listening, and they are in the vast majority that are investing only two hours per week in their own learning, learning growth development, what would you say to them that 
they could maybe be more intentional because as you're talking about this idea of being a jukebox, one of the things that popped into my mind, the more that I have read and have, have learned, it's funny because I used to listen to music all the time. Like I can sit here and like hear a beat and my wife will attest to this. I can hear a beat, maybe just a small snippet of a song from the late nineties, early two thousands. And I'm like, that's the song. Like I'm just, to know so much about that genre but now it's like i don't really listen to music anymore i'm reading i'm listening to podcasts my whole ethos has changed so i guess the final question is for those who are struggling with time to read to learn to grow what would be your response to them yeah so i've got i've got three things uh, the first one is a great quote by Seth Godin. You don't need more time. You just need to decide. Mm. Um, not having enough time is is code for I'm not prioritizing this. So that's that's the first thing. Uh, the, the second thing is, is a story. Uh, which you knew that was coming. Um, but uh, there, you know, in, in 1911, there was two groups uh, that raced to the South Pole to be the, the first to go on foot uh, 900 miles one way, 900 miles back, and plant their flag. One was the Union Jack, uh, led by Sir Robert Falcon Scott. The other one uh, was the uh, Norwegian flag, uh, led by Roald Amundsen. All right. Uh, these two groups went out into the unknown, a lot of treacherous terrain, a lot of, uh, a lot of uncertainty, right? Mm. And uh, not only does Admonson's team make it there first. They get there like two weeks before um, Scott's team. And uh, what's really interesting is the difference between the two men. Scott was just focused on his promotion, and this was the thing to do to get promoted. And so that's why he really wanted to lead this expedition. He was leading with a lot of ego. Um, Roald Amundsen was just passionate about polar exploration. And he read every single book he could get his hands on by every explorer who had gone before him. And so he had an appreciation for what they were about to face. Now, the story doesn't end there because it's 900 miles one way, 900 miles back. The only way we know what happened to Sir Robert Falcon Scott's team is that we found their journals next to their frozen bodies in their tents. Mm. Admonson brought every single person home. And so I like truncated a very long story into just a few minutes. Um, but I think it, it has application for all of us is that, um, you know, we're all leading teams through a lot of uncertainty and we can either lead having an appreciation for the environment. And that gave Admonson the competitive edge to see opportunities that nobody else saw and to prepare for friction, which Scott's team did not. Or we can be like Scott and just be like, oh, I don't have time. I'm just going to go off my own experience and, uh, and see where that gets us. And that's a story that's motivated me. And then the last point is this. I wake up every morning. I have to go to physical fitness at 630. Um, I sometimes get home around 6, 7 o'clock at night. Um, I deploy anywhere in the world. And I have still been able to find time for reading. I've been able to... Um, you know, be committed to my family to invest in them as well. So like, if I can do it amidst deployments, amidst all this crazy stuff that happens with a life in the military, I could imagine somebody that's working in a different career field can also make time. That's a fantastic way to wrap up, Joe. And I want to just add to your story about the environment, being mindful let 2020, let that past experience be a learning opportunity for how quickly the environment is changing, how quickly the environment is transforming. And as a result, what transformations must we continue to undergo as a leader to guide others through the complexity of change with courage and with commitment? Joe, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing time, sharing space, sharing your own stories with us today. If someone is listening and they want to continue to learn from you, what is the best way for them to do so? Uh, go check out our website at fromthegreennotebook.com. Uh, like I said, it's not just my story. It's the stories of 
of hundreds of people all throughout the military who are sharing lessons from their green notebooks to help others lead. Uh, check out the podcast. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, I get to interview and have conversations with uh, leaders, athletes, authors uh, about this stuff. And then finally, I have a monthly reading list email that, that, that comes out where I recommend three to five books a month. You can find that on the website or this weekly email series called the Sunday email where I've been diving into the hero's journey every, every Sunday morning uh, since January 1, 2023. That's from the green notebook.com. Connect with Joe, learn with Joe, grow with Joe. Joe, thanks again for joining me for another episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. This has been an absolute honor and a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun today, buddy. Thank you. As always, and until next time, be well, do good, and be the light. Thank you.